what I'm gonna do is just explain what I have here on the table really quick. Um, my talk is like a little over 30 minutes, so not too bad. And um, I wanna leave the rest for answering questions and also have possibly have open discussion. We'll see what happens. Um, and uh, the first one here is uh, a roster that I'll explain later. Um, and then I have a petition that is going to the city of East Hampton. It is for East Hampton residents, both of my petitions. Um, one is about the cigarettes that use uh, plastic cigarette butts mm -hmm. and uh, to try to ban those from the stores and also to advocate that um, there's more um, action as far as uh, police action if someone flicks their cigarettes to have corrective actions taken. Um, and then the other uh, petition is about converting uh, public lawn spaces into polycultures of native perennial plants, um, sort of do, do some permaculture design, and as an example that also private landowners can view and learn how to do to their own uh, lawns uh, to convert into uh, growing food, not lawns, so increase food security and sequester carbon at the same time. Um, and then the last form here is um, is from my lawyer. Like um, I have gotten into trouble for speaking in a loud voice in public, and um, if anyone is interested in uh, testifying to what they've seen me do in public and um, and support my cases, there's a letter that you can grab if you're interested in doing that. Um, I also have a few books here, and if you like it, you can take it. And first come, first serve, of course, on that one. <laughs> Alright. Without further ado, I'm just going to go ahead and start. Um, okay, so, in the Marines, I was a combat photographer and videographer. I became a staff sergeant after serving seven years, and I left the court to go to the film school at Full Sail University in Winter Park, Florida. I dreamt about filming a blockbuster film about angels fighting the war in heaven. After graduating with a bachelor's in film, I went to New York to master photography and oddly enough, ended up being an intern for photographers that shot covers for Vogue magazine. After watching many documentaries on Netflix and YouTube about the environmental crisis in my apartment in Brooklyn, I began to question my life path. I, was, uh, I saw a video from Anonymous announcing that there was going to be an occupation in Lower Manhattan. I was excited to join the revolution. I went to Zuccotti Park on September the 17th, 2011 to participate in the movement. Before you know it, I was getting grabbed out of uh, marches by police officers and I lost my job at Milk Studios for being in jail instead of showing up for work. At the same time, my roommates were telling me that I had to pay more than the $250 a month that I was paying to sleep on the couch. So I left my apartment and became fully dedicated to the Occupy Wall Street movement. Maybe God knew that I wanted to give back to the world that our society is so busy destroying. I participated in the outreach working group by speaking loudly on the steps of the Federal Hall in front of the Stock Exchange, holding signs throughout the city, giving talks in the subways as we distributed the Occupy Wall Street Journal, and I gave informational handouts at tables in public parks. I made some real amazing friends. Our tent at Zuccotti Park was the band fracking tent. We surrounded, uh, being surrounded by activists that cared so much about the planet was an amazing experience and every day was full of educational conversations that brought light to many different issues and people were sharing their ideas of how to resolve them. During the occupation, I experienced the NYPD using tactics to strategically find excuses to arrest protesters that peacefully exercise their rights to free speech and to assemble. I found out then that our rights are being alienated. Police officers are using statutes from the penal code such as the statute of disturbing the peace, disorderly conduct, loitering, and statutes against congregating, which is a synonym of assemble, 
to commit treason and directly violate their oath to the Constitution by incriminating people who exercise their rights. I stayed in the streets of Lower Manhattan after the police raided the camp. My good friend Jason taught me how to live homeless. He showed me where to go shower for free, where to find food, and what the best spots to sleep at were. After several months, surviving in the streets became tiresome, so Jason took me to Occupy Farms in Aminia, New York. They allowed occupiers who became homeless for the movement to live in 180 acres of forest with a farmhouse and an old barn. The land there was beautiful, or is beautiful, as there's, they're still there. Um, it was a valley with a swimming hole at the creek under a willow tree that is next to a beaver dam. We spent time hiking the woods on Rattlesnake Mountain, and we spent many hours learning about plants. I learned that weeds are actually edible and medicinal herbs. I became aware that humanity was never banned from the Garden of Eden. Paradise was never lost. It was simply forgotten. This farm facilitated my connection with the natural world, and I fell absolutely in love with our mother, nature. After living at the farm for a few years, I became the lonely farmer. I was surrounded by people who didn't like hard work and would rather party and get high on mushrooms than try to build a sustainable future. I did all the gardening on my own. I grew vegetables, but the majority of income that I made from the farm came from harvesting and drying wild herbs. Well, I also spent a great deal of time studying. I found that there are many problems, and fortunately, there are solu solutions for all of them. Buddha didn't become the Buddha until after he escaped his imprisonment in the palace that catered to his every desire, and he saw the suffering of the world. So let's take a look. From what I've gathered, scientists have been telling us about global warming since before 1859, when an Irish physicist uh, with five honorary doctorates, John Tyndall, proved the connection between atmospheric CO2 and what is now known as the greenhouse effect by measuring the radiative properties of various gases. Savant Arrhenius was one of the founding scientists of physical chemistry who was awarded the Nobel Prize in 1903. In 1896, he demonstrated that human-caused carbon dioxide emissions are large enough to cause global warming. <laughs> NASA scientists have informed us that Venus is hotter than Mercury due to the high carbon dioxide concentrations in its atmosphere. Carbon isotopes prove that the excess warming is caused by the burning of fossil fuels. Different sources of carbon contain different isotopes. All plants and animals contain similar ratios of C14, and this particular isotope is used for carbon dating. Fossil fuels are so old that their carbon emissions lack the C14 isotopes. As the level of carbon dioxide has been increasing, the measurements of carbon dioxide containing C14 isotopes has steadily been decreasing. On the year I was born, in 1982, Exxon scientists made startling accurate predictions of the carbon levels of 2019. Dr. Ed Gravy and Dr. Martin Hoffert are both former Exxon scientists that testified in Congress, stating that climate change from fossil fuels is not only real, but it is happening at much higher rates than we have recorded from the geological record. Dr. Hoffert further stated that there is no doubt that man-caused global warming is real since there has been about 20 years of consensus from working scientists that published in peer-reviewed journals. 97% or more of climate scientists agree with anthropogenic, meaning human-caused global warming. Methane gas released from animal agriculture, the melting permafrost, the gas leaks from natural gas industry are 81 times more potent a greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. Nitrous oxide emitted by the agricultural use of chemical fertilizers is 310 times more potent than carbon dioxide and is also depleting the ozone layer. The natural gas industry is fracking the earth. This process is poisoning well water and making tap water flammable for U.S. citizens. Gas leaks from the industry release methane and are common throughout the nation. 
Our own city of East Hampton has several locations where gas leaks are currently occurring. It took millions of years for the planet to sequester carbon in the form of fossil fuels to give us the climate of the Holocene era. Ever since humanity started burning fossil fuels, our use has roughly doubled every 10 years and continues to soar as populations grow. As a result, we've caused the rise of the Anthropocene era. Scientists are warning that in our near future, we can experience a global food security crisis and social, uh, uh, social collapse if we don't reverse the warming. Events are unfolding much quicker than scientists have predicted. Concerned scientists have explained that the IPCC report is watered down by political intervention. The actual science gives more dire circumstances. We are already beginning to leave behind the regularity of climate that gives us the capability to grow crops reliably. The extremes in weather are already causing crops to fail around the world. Farmers in Europe alone have lost millions of dollars due to climate change from heat waves and flooding from rains that don't stop for weeks. Farmers are describing their efforts as gambling. Yet many people are not feeling the consequences of climate change because they receive global imports of food and do not rely solely on local agriculture. Scientists are witnessing the sixth mass extinction. Hundreds of scientists are becoming uh, are hundreds of species are becoming extinct at an alarming rate due to human activity. Currently, there are about one million animals on the endangered species list. Forests are our saving grace, yet we are actively burning and cutting down forests for business interests in such a massive scale of devastation. Satellite images give clear evidence of our disease-like plundering of the planet, all while an escalating rate of wildfires are igniting with over 20 million acres burning down in Australia alone. Even the Arctic went ablaze in 2019, along with the Amazon, Siberia, Alaska, California, Central Africa, and Spain. An iceberg bigger than Los Angeles broke off Antarctica. A couple months later, an iceberg the size of Seattle broke off Antarctica. The media said it was normal. An example of how important or how ignorant the economic system is to the environment and to people is the fact that the animal agriculture industry is responsible for about 50% of the emissions that cause global warming. The animal industry is cutting, clear cutting millions of acres of forests to grow the food needed to feed livestock, to produce steak that contributes to heart disease, while 16,000 children die of starvation around the world every day. The wine industry emits five times more carbon into the atmosphere than all plane travel combined. 96% of beer that was tested came up positive for pesticides like glyphosate that increases our ch chances of cancer by 41%. And in the field, these chemicals are killing pollinators like bees and even hummingbirds. Microplastics are in the air we breathe. They're in our food, they're in our water. Microplastics have been found in sea salt, in seafood, in Arctic ice samples, and rain samples from the Rocky Mountains and in the ocean floor. Plastics are exposing people to harmful chemicals that can negatively influence our DNA, our anti-testosterone, and, and can increase our risk of cancer. You drink microplastics from synthetic tea bags. We contaminate water with microplastics every time we wash synthetic clothing. Earthworms cannot live in soils contaminated with microplastics. Landfills cause the groundwater nearby lakes and rivers to be contaminated with chemicals called leachate that comes from the buried plastics. I've seen videos of waves filled with plastics as far as the eye can see. Millions of wild animals are mistaking plastic for food and die of starvation from having stomachs full of plastic. They get into death traps from plastic bags, containers, nets, and circular pieces that choke or suffocate them. Every oil spill in the ocean kills millions of animals by suffocation and hypothermia. Do you know how many oil spills there have been? The Gulf of Mexico has waves covered in black spots and has a yellowish brownish tint. 
septic leakage, road runoff, and agricultural runoff poisons our rivers, lakes, and ponds. Toxic algae blooms that form from this contamination cause brain damage to people and kills wildlife and pets that drink from the water. <coughs> 721 million premature deaths occur annually due to air pollution around the world. The coal industry pollutes hundreds of acres of land and many miles of rivers with carcinogens, neurotoxins, and other poisons including arsenic, cadmium, chromium, lead, mercury, selenium, radium, and more. These contaminants cause cancer, kidney disease, reproductive harm, and damage to nervous system, especially in children. That's enough bad news, or is it? How much of the reality that is so depressing must we acknowledge before we realize that it's time to evolve? We do not live in a fairy tale land. The American dream is destroying the planet. It's easy for people to get distracted in our society. I feel obligated to engage with the public to raise awareness and sound the alarm. Hopefully, we take action soon to make the changes that are needed. Allow me to address the source of all our woes. We desperately need an economic system that is not hostile to the environment. Our government is instituted to secure our right to life, not to threaten the life of our posterity or future generations. We are forced to participate in this destructive system. A slave is totally dependent on his or her master, and we are totally dependent on the fossil fuel industry. BP reports that there are 53.3 years left of oil. Even if those reserves could last 100 more years, it is not wise to remain dependent on a depleting resource. We are not making a living by contributing to the fossil fuel industry. We are participating in a war against life on Earth. The Nazis said that they had no choice, but we always have a choice. We are enslaved to the corporate empire of greed and ignorance to natural laws. It's time to join the rebellion of truth. Nature is the truth, and nature makes the rules. We are literally playing a dangerous game of monopoly with our children's futures. A truly intelligent species would do things that make ecological sense. Most elements of nature cooperate with each other to facilitate life. Instead of competing in a game of winners and losers, we can regard our community as a tribe of united families and cooperate with each other to live in abundance and be of benefit to the land at the same time. We will all die one day. What truly matters is leaving a legacy behind for future generations. Our government must reorganize itself in order to truly form a more perfect union that can uphold the promise to ensure domestic <coughs> tranquility, support the general welfare, and secure these blessings to our posterity. In 1933, our nation went from using gold as money to the fiat currency that we use today. The government did this by implementing a gold seizure. People who did not turn in their gold coins, gold bullion, gold certificates faced up to $10,000 in fines and up to 10 years in prison. If our nation is capable of making such a drastic change in our economic system, then we can definitely alter the economic system to make ecological sense and be socially humane. Is this the home of the brave? Do we have the courage to accept the truth about the ongoing climate and environmental crisis? To accept the truth means to act as if the truth is real. We must work to change our collective behavior. The current economic system is a dangerous creation of our own misguided imaginations. It is not grounded in reality. Nature is reality, and the physics of nature do not negotiate. There is no such thing as infinite economic growth on a finite planet. The U.S. has only 4% of the world's population and consumes over 30% of the world's resources. A corporate entity is not a person, but our laws say that they are. When they commit crimes against humanity and crimes against the environment, no one on the board that made those decisions goes to jail. Instead, the corporate entity is sued. Oftentimes, the corporation is aware of the penalties of their actions 
and if profits exceed the penalties, then getting sued is of little consequence to them. Multinational corporations as people had a psychological evaluation done. They were given a diagnosis of dangerous psychopaths. The U.S. is in debt to the tune of over $22 trillion, and we owe this debt not to any bank, but to the natural world in which we live. We all live on a rock, spinning in space. We need to stop destroying this place. It's not going to work out in Mars. <laughs> China used permaculture design to restore a massive degraded ecosystem called the Lowest Plateau. It was financed with a $300 million loan from the World Bank, while the U.S. spends $250 million a day on war. People who pioneer a sustainable life in America have suffered arrests and have faced criminal charges for collecting rainwater, for growing food in their yard, for letting wild herbs grow, and for harvesting wind energy in their front yards. I feel responsible to do my part to solve our problems, and that journey began with the mind. I learned in film school that TV and movies project a hypnotic signal and send subliminal messages that have a real impact on our mental programming. We should program ourselves carefully. I feel strongly that time must be spent living with purpose. I'm motivated to do all I can because I often spend time bearing witness to the real suffering caused by our collective impact. The reality of the horrors that our society creates in this world does not disappear when we ignore it. Ignorance is not bliss. The truth does not set us free. It beckons us to change. Silence and inaction are equal to participating in the injustice. America is like a sleeping giant. Once awakened, we can mobilize to make radical changes to our economic system and create an ecologically sane society. Individual change is very important, but we will not be successful unless we act in unity and work together towards human evolution with ecologically functional design and our caring and loving hearts for this majestic mystery of life. We must have a dedicated and ongoing drive to hold on to our vision of an ecologically sane society and take advantage of every opportunity to take practical steps of accomplishing it. I urge you that it's time to organize a movement of the people's right to assemble and to work together to alter our government as it is our right to do so. If we do not assert our rights, then we have none. If we don't come together and organize ourselves, we will continue to be at the mercy of corporate powers. The planet is in a real crisis. Nature has the wisdom which is the cure. Permaculture is a holistic system designed science that mimics nature and teaches ethics and principles that can be used to organize human activities to provide for every human need while being of benefit to the environment at the same time. Permaculture is two words put together. Permanence, which means to endeavor in indefinitely. Culture, that which sustains human existence on the planet. Permaculture has three basic ethics. Earth care, people care, and return of surplus back towards earth care and people care. This design science is the first to focus on design that is functional with the ecosystem. It has been used to restore degraded landscapes to green deserts with food forests, to provide an abundant way of life to communities all around the world that apply its principles. Most people understand permaculture as a way to garden or permanent agriculture. This is a limitation to the design science of permaculture that can be applied in every human endeavor from building homes to supplying energy to reorganizing departments in our government. Sustainability is not enough to solve the ecological crisis. We need to alter our society to not just restore the land and the waters and the air, but to maintain regenerative cycles that increases fertility and resilience of the environment over time. With permaculture design, cities can become mostly self-reliant, producing their own energy, food, water, and needing little to no resources from outside their community. Permaculture design is ecologically beneficial and economically profitable as consumer culture is replaced by a culture of producers that create yields from the systems that support a genuine livelihood that does not contribute to the destruction of the environment we depend on 
for survival. Having communities dependent on a global market disconnects people from the knowledge and skills of surviving in the local environment. Therefore, we have ecological insecurities. We can mitigate our global impact by becoming more self-reliant, but our system is more motivated to cause disparity to others over access to resources than to do the work necessary to provide for ourselves regeneratively and to assist others to do the same. Some practical examples. Compressed air can be used as a fuel in compressed air engines. In one of Bill Mollison's courses, the biologist who wrote the Permaculture's Designer's Manual, he explains that a two square foot tank of 1,000 PSI can power a car to travel 300 miles, and there were thousands of these vehicles in Europe. The exhaust is clean, cold air and can act as a cooler that keeps your groceries chilled. A Trump system, not Trump, T-R-O-M-P-E system can collect compressed air alongside rivers passively and do not cause any pollution. Biogas digesters are an alternative to a septic system. It takes water, wastewater from the bathroom and the kitchen and can provide two different yields. It provides a high quality, quality liquid fertilizer because it, it biodigests everything that goes into it and you can use the methane to heat your home and to cook with. This system will not cause the septic leakage issues that give rise to toxic algae blooms today. A rocket mass stove heater burns less wood to heat a home than a conventional fireplace and has a clean exhaust. A stick fire burning for one hour can heat a living space for over 48 hours. The fuel from these stoves can come from trees that are known to coppice, which means that you can cut the tree down and it will grow back. Some trees that do this actually live longer from seasonal cuttings. Aesthetic landscaping is a war against nature. An easy way to reverse our impact is to simply allow biology to grow and chop and drop as needed. I have a petition for the city to convert public lawn space to polycultures of native edible perennial plants that are resilient to climate change. They require the least amount of maintenance, <coughs> sequester carbon, and provide food security. The common practice of collecting leaves and sticks that fall on the ground and removing them from the land prevents the accumulation of organic matter that creates rich <coughs> soils. Soil is depleting around the world at a rate that is larger than all pollution combined. Healthy soil is one of the greatest forms of true wealth. Here are some plastic solutions. Single-use plastics can be degraded to compostable materials. Several different varieties of mushroom mycelium can eat plastics. The most popular is oyster mushroom mycelium. Larvae from waxworms also eat plastics. Waste management can be reformed to use biological solutions. Plastics can be made from many different sources. One of the most impressive to me is from cactus because the plants are perennial, which means it stays alive for a long time and leaves can be periodically harvested. Seaweed, avocado pits, cornstarch, hemp, and cassava root are also good sources of plastic replacements. When water is overflowing from the tub, you don't grab the mop and get to work to clean it, the mess up until after the faucet is turned off. We need to do the same with petroleum-based plastics. Recycling petroleum-based plastics and reintroducing them into a market is not a solution when the public consumers are obviously totally irresponsible with toxic waste. Since I've been picking up plastics from the um, ground around the East Hampton, it, it doesn't stop. It keeps coming and some weeks are worse than others. Um, when water, okay, I already said that, sorry. We need to introduce legislation to demand that the plastic industries transition to ecologically sane products. Meanwhile, consumer power is very real and avoiding plastic is most effective when the products are boycotted and letters are written to the companies explaining who is boycotting and why. John Perkins, the author of New Confessions from an Economic Hitman, believes this is an effective strategy to convince companies to change. 
he suggests that we say to the companies that, hey, I love your product, but I'm not buying anymore because so and so. So if you stop, then I'll gladly start purchasing again. Writing to our representatives and advocating bans on plastic is a five minute task that everybody should do, but we'll also leave you saying that was too easy. What else can be done? Supporting local agriculture and getting fresh produce and bringing your own basket or reusable bag should be common practice. Local farms should grow during the winter as local self-reliance can decrease the need for plastics. There is a good book I ran across that teaches farmers how to grow crops all year round in Canada. If they can do it up there, we can definitely do it here in Massachusetts. I suggest that we assert our right to assemble and make the attempt to create system changes needed for our future survival. The Occupy Wall Street movement had an interesting process to facilitate a general assembly and coordinate uh, uh, efforts towards working groups. I learned simple examples of direct democracy from intentional communities and cooperative organizations that use sociocracies that were very similar. Sociocracy is a self-organizing model that gives an equal voice to its members. A general assembly meets to create working groups or circles with unique agendas. In their meetings, rounds are done to listen to each circle member individually to discuss goals and issues, generate plans and solutions, organize and execute those plans, and to collect feedback and do evaluations for the group's progress. Delegates and leaders of each circle or working group meet to cooperate in a symbiotic relationship with each other to accomplish the unified vision. A routine general assembly is open to the public to give report backs from the working groups and collect agendas from the public and to form new working groups as needed. I have found that groups work better and have less conflict when people are aware and practice basic skills from nonviolent communication as taught by Dr. Marshall Rosenberg. I have dreamed of creating a holistic research institute with like-minded people so we can hold space to facilitate the movement of the People's Assembly. The institute can live the change as a permaculture demonstration site and generate an income through education, renting space as a nature retreat, selling yields uh, from the food forest, or providing holistic health services. Not much. <laughs> sorry, so sorry. It's okay. <laughs> I'm a big dreamer, I know, and I hope that at least we can assist the East Hampton Climate Action Group, the Sunrise Movement East Hampton Hub, and or Extinction Rebellion. It would be wonderful if we could meet each other more often so that neighbors can connect and share ideas for direct action for positive change. Maybe we can build a community resource with the People's Assembly Us, which is the <coughs> website that I purchased, and uh, so far I have one uh, designer that contacted me that's interested, so a work in progress. And um, we can organize uh, permablitz events that assist our neighbors to turn their lawns into permaculture design, perennial, uh, native edible polycultures, known as forest gardens. Um, we can work together to establish a community food forest to help motivate landowners to design their landscapes with resilient design. And we can spend time in nature together and practice earth skills. We can also take the time to prepare ourselves for the unknown and give ourselves a greater sense of security with plans for collective support of each other. We are all in this together. We can make things better and we should make things better, but it's up to us. I'm usually one lonely activist in the streets of East Hampton and I've gotten a lot of feedback from people who told me that they've made lifestyle sacrifices and changes in their businesses because of my efforts. If we work together with the same ongoing drive and vision, we can bring an even greater impact and make some well needed positive changes. You're a hero and it's time to save the world. The path of the hero starts by accepting the truth and to take the call to adventure on the path towards ecological justice. There is a suffering planet full of life that is begging for us to wake up to our superpowers to help save the planet. 
Our nation needs to focus on resolving the climate and environmental crisis as we focused our economy during World War II and as we did when we raced to go to the moon. Unless we cure the root cause of illness, then different symptoms of disease will continue to surface. And the root cause of all our issues is the economic system itself. And to cure our ethics of earth care, people care, to return the surplus back to earth care and people care, and to acknowledge objective truths, truths that are scientific facts that are true whether we believe in them or not. Greta Thunberg explained that when she began her activism, she mainly dedicated one day out of the week to strike for the climate. It's time to do more than just vote once every few years. I suggest we get as many concerned citizens together. Every change that is necessary begins in the mind. Let's break through the barriers in our own minds that tell us that there's nothing we can do and that the system cannot be changed. Are you willing to put in the time and willing to commit to assist each other in evolving towards a more socially humane and ecologically sane society? The only commitment required is to take one small and persistent step at a time until we restore paradise. I pray that we can all unite as allies in the rebellion of truth with our collective genius we can create the legacy our posterity deserves to inherit. Thank you. I love you all. <laughs> Thanks for being here, and uh, well, now this time is uh, dedicated to you guys and whatever um, questions you may have or uh, topics that you want to raise, and or we could just mingle. And there's food, and um, the, the petitions will be up here. Anybody can come anytime and sign it. Um, first of all, any questions from anybody? What do you think about the Green New Deal? I advocate the, the Green New Deal. That's actually one of the signs uh, that are up here. I, um, I read it. It's only 14 pages long. It's an easy read. And I, I think it, it makes sense. Um, I understand people's sort of like um, not understanding how it could be completely doable. Um, but I think that um, through jobs creation and with permaculture design, the, the knowledge of permaculture design and creating more jobs centered and focused on ecological um, functional designs for humanity, uh, it could totally be done, and and I, I I have a lot of faith in it. If it, it just depends, of course, if uh, if you all back it up, and and everybody else in the nation becomes more aware of uh, ecological solutions that are possible through job creation. But I'm really enthused about the idea of converting lawns to the benefit. Can you that, Jose? Question. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm just enthused about those ideas about converting lawns to be more ecologically beneficial as opposed to being a, a poison pit. Um, but I have no idea how that might manifest, you know, and I would be enthusiastic about it if anybody has any brilliant ideas. I think that, like, this is um, an example of, I can show you guys. Um, so if we were to do the people's exam uh, assembly, for example, there would be a um, general assembly, and then the general assembly would make working groups, and one of those working groups could be the uh, the perma blitz groups. Perma blitz is the term that uh, is popular online that they use for this type of a movement, where. Um, people get together in groups and they visit people's property and they'll do a permaculture design and then implement it. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so we can help each other out doing it and uh, and just by uh, volunteering to, to help each other out to help uh, do, what, do what's right for the planet and, and to support the community. And that's how I see it uh, being able to be done. And it can uh -huh. be done uh, on a zero budget because uh, actually like, 
a lot of um, you don't have to go buying a bunch of trees. Uh, it could you know, and uh, I think that also when when people start to create the group, like they can f find ways to get funding if they want to buy trees. But actually, like starting things from seed is actually better because um, I don't know if you are aware, but like if you plant something in a pot and it has a tap root, well, the tap root actually stops growing as soon as it hits something. And so when you start something in a pot and, and then you, you stop the tap root from growing, um, that sort of stunts the ability of the tree. But if you plant it from seed on the ground, then the tap root's gonna grow down as far as it needs to. It, you also, when you start from seed on the land, the seed has uh, an ability to like, um, just kind of acclimize itself to the environment better, starting things from seed. Um, and that's something that the permaculture industry has been talking a lot about because climate is changing. Like certain trees are not doing so well. Like, so somebody was telling me that, hey, the apples aren't doing so well sometimes. And, um, and, and maybe the peaches are gonna be doing better. And so like starting to plant things from seed in the ground is a way to like um, sort of like keep that genetic continuity and, and, and resilient of the plant, resilience of the plant uh, a little better. So, but like, yeah, that's just a small way how I see, like, we can convert all our lawns into food forests, uh, just working together. Hello. Hi. Hi, Jose. Um, for, I just wanted to make a statement about some of the things you're talking about with agriculture. Absolutely. Is it all right if I stand up? Yes. All right. My name is um, Rose Lynch. I'm, I live in Cottage Square, and I've made friends with Jose over the last few months. Um, I just wanted to say in terms of agriculture, I, I had a, a six-year career in, in an incorporated farm in the valley um, that focused on berries and I thought that that was going to be my life's work and I got really disillusioned with, with the, the system. Um, not because they're bad people at all, they're not, but um, they, they preached IPM, which is Integrated Pest Management, which is a low spray system that involves bringing in beneficial um, organisms such as um, you know bugs that kill aphids, extra pollinators, and it sounds really good until you realize that um, every couple of years the United States determines that certain fumigants that are um, put into the soil before planting to kill certain kinds of funguses, that this, this sort of thing, every few years they determine, wait, that one is a carcinogen wait, that one is an endocrine disruptor. And as people recertify their pesticide licenses, they say, this thing that is working so well for you, pyrethrin or whatever it is, next year you can't use it anymore. And we're a capitalist society, there's a huge production of these popular chemicals. What happens is, there's a stockpile, it's now illegal to deal in this stuff. So what are the choices? You dump it in your, in your river, most people don't do that. You dump it somewhere. You, you seal it up in barrels. Those things all cost money. You're going to have to pay someone to haul it away. So what we do as a society, as a country, is we send it to nations that don't have regulation. And those, regu those regulations are very lax in Central and South America. So when we buy a box of berries from Big E and a little clamshell that my kids always ask for, I know that they're sprayed with things that were banned in this country four years ago. And I'm not faulting anybody for buying discount chemicals and trying to make a living. But we need to be aware of the fact that we're behind the times in terms of what is actually bad for us. We can't, we're not acting fast enough because, as Jose said, there's so much money involved in selling the new solution to the aphid or the fungus. And it's just the same as vaccines. We're not keeping up. And we need to simplify and we need to admit to the fact that we shouldn't be eating certain things year round. It doesn't make sense. Unless your you know, food storage is a, is a viable option to keep things you know, through the winter. Anyway, that's all I had to say. And thank you, Jose, for hosting this event. Mm -hmm. Thank, Thank you guys for showing up. Any other questions? What do you think about using lawns for just like doing pollinator lawns? 
Would you support pollinator lawns versus permaculture? Well, the, uh, all right, so a permaculture uh, polyculture system includes the pollinators. Uh, it's it's part of the system. So you you would be doing uh, multiple things at once with the permaculture system versus if dedicating it strictly to to pollinators, and um, because you you can serve multiple purposes. It's, it's, it's sort of it's the same thing. Um, inviting the different pollinators is essential. And it's actually what you want to do when you're growing food because um, you don't want to use the pesticides, you don't want to use the chemicals. So the nature is the solution. So you would use um, the, the appropriate plants for our region that attracts the right pollinators that actually keeps um, the pests at bay. Um, so it's, it's almost like uh, when, when there's something that's out of balance, you find, you find the tree or the plant that facilitates the, the balancing uh, solution. Uh, the same thing with a lot of the uh, polycultures, they're beneficial towards each other. So like you will have nitrogen fixing plants, you have plants that are specific for creating fertile soil uh, next to plants that like to extract nutrients from that soil. And you also have uh, different plants that are called bioaccumulators that grow very deep roots and they extract a bunch of um, minerals, different minerals, and make it available to the topsoil. Um, the whole idea of chop and drop that I mentioned is uh, sort of a permaculture idea that like every plant is harvesting something from that land. And, and the cycle of creating topsoil is, of course, the decay and, and all the, the life dying and falling and then creating new soil but if you stop that process then what happens is there's a depletion of the nutrients and the desertification of the land that happens over time so uh, to chop and drop is sort of just saying okay nature we understand what you're doing and we're going to help you do it faster and um <coughs> and grow soil much faster so if you were to do your front lawn <coughs> what kind of plantings are you talking about well, they, can you give me examples of... They would be uh, native uh, plants, so native means that they're native to the region and they've, they've grown here uh, for a very long time. Um, edible means that they provide some sort of an edible uh, crop, whether it be the leaves or the roots and tubers that grow or um, the fruit that it bears. There's some sort of uh, medicinal or edible quality to the plant. And then um, perennial means it's long-lived which means it's not an annual plant. Like many, many civilizations have risen and fell because of their dependency on annual crops. And when you, when you shift towards perennials, now like you're not disturbing the soil that much, the plant stays there, it lives for like 30, 40 years to 100 years, however long. Um, it's, it's, either, um, it's, either, it's either herbal type uh, grassy plant or it's a uh, bush or it's a shrub or it's a tree and or a vine and so you you build layers like a forest you mimic a forest and build layers um, making openings for the sun and um, and understanding their relationships with each other and planting them next to each other because it's permanent right so it's, it's, it's for long term so you want to do it right the first time that's why it's, um, it's important to get started on this sooner than later because actually to, to do a, a really good permaculture design, sometimes it could take up to a year of, of observing the landscape and really knowing what you're getting into, of what happens, because there's other things that come into mind, like especially depending on how big you get. Like, we need to address, like, are there periodic floods in this region? What are the right plants to help protect from flooding? What are the... Uh, to, to, to prevent the erosion from, from, uh, from happening. And uh, where's the fire sector? Where are the uh, fire retardant plants that we can plant in, in the fire sector to prevent fires? So it's, it's, um, it's a very involved, very intelligent, very aware uh, um, design science that, um, that puts the right plants in the right place with the, with the right um, relationships. Yes. Hi, I'm Brent Maurer. And um, a couple years ago, uh, in the paper, there was an article, and, and it helped me to really start to think about my yard as a, pollin a pollinator habitat, and also birds and stuff. So uh, it said that UMass had done a study where they um, 
uh, they had three groups and um, they mowed their lawns at different intervals. Um, some people mowed their lawn as usual and then other people had a longer space between mowings. And then the last one you know, wasn't very popular with their neighbors because you know the grass got quite high. And the reason is because there's all kinds of little pollinators that you don't even see that live in, in, your, in your grass. You know, like when I really look close, there's teeny little flowers that grow in your grass. Well, my grass. I don't have a cultured <laughs> lawn. <laughs> but um, uh, so I just, I'm, I'm also composting. And so I'm taking that compost and I'm, you know, um, reinforcing my, per and so I did start some perennial beds. And I integrated um, herbs and food in the perennial beds and then pots and all kinds of stuff. So, I mean, if you're looking for a place to start, those are some things that you can start with. And I put up, um, the garden store sells a little, a little house that has habitat for pollinators, you know, the kind that, uh, like a pine cone that's in there and, and, you know, certain things like that. And then bamboo shoots that are cut short and bees like to go in there. And, you know, it's, it's just another way. And then I have all kinds of uh, bird boxes and I leave out water for the animals in the winter and I feed the birds till the bears come out and um, so I mean there are th these are places where I've begun to start and uh, I'm slowly turning my yard into one bed after another and I'm I'm targeting the, uh, the uh, pollinators and um, it's a lot of fun mm -hmm. um, and but you know it's taken like four years and I swear to God when I bought this house the woman probably died of like pesticide poisoning because she sprayed for everything. She was terrified of like all kinds of bugs. I, I could tell by the sprays and stuff. And so slowly I've been like, you know, uh, I don't use anything. And I'm just letting things come in. And like, if the ants are going to start to come in, I'll put something organic down on the ground to keep them from coming in. So. Uh, I'm trying to make my yard as habitable as I can for all kinds of critters and some I don't really want like gophers and chipmunks <laughs> and dig holes but you know they gotta live somewhere. Yeah. Thanks so much for your service. So I, first I want to thank you for bringing this all together and, mm -hmm. and holding down this space for long enough that people were interested. Um, and bringing the expertise already that you've got in this room is fantastic to hear from even just a couple of people. Um, I really believe in everything that you're saying, um, and I, I would love to know a little bit more about the kind of organization, the form of organization you're talking about, and then what kind of commitment you're, you know, ideally you'd be looking for, what you would pitch. Because um, I'm ready to sign on, I just you know <laughs> want to know what uh, what you right would, on. Right, you'd so like us to sign it's, on to. It's going to be an organic process um, <laughs> because um, I'm sort of pleading for help right. as, <laughs> as well because I have a lot of ideas in my mind, but I as far as like you know practically getting it done, I know that there's a lot of professionals here and like. Uh, last I heard, if I wanted to start a nonprofit organization, I couldn't do it on my own anyways. I needed to, if I need to find at least two other people that want to do it with me. So this is sort of my cry for help, cry for like whoever wants to participate. And it's very much going to be a group thing. I don't, I don't uh, see myself as a leader. I don't even see myself as an expert in any of these uh, topics. I know a lot about a lot of different things, but I am in no case an expert in one specific thing. Um, so the roster is sort of our way of uniting and and to collaborate on how to practically get those ideas done. But I, as far as how I envision it right now, it's like obviously I feel that we need to start uh, possibly a nonprofit organization for the People's Assembly and um, have a way to like bring in and manage funds, uh, build a board, um, you know, and uh, and and see uh, where it wants to take it. But like we have to understand that if we want to do the um, people's assembly, that it, it it has diverse, like it depends on the participants, whoever wants to come and participate. And I also 
I, I don't feel that um, not everybody really needs to be grounded like a board member or anything like that. Like, I wanted to be a lot like Occupy Wall Street, where it's sort of like you, they, they hold events and, and people can show up and have their voice heard. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm a person and, and, and uh, I just want to, I'm interested in, like, there could be a, a constitution working group. It could be an outreach working group. People that want to just help spread the word. People that want to um, actually help change our our um, our uh, the legislation, um, and so whatever interests. Um, and of course, like um, if you just want to participate with East Hampton Climate Action, they're here. Um, can y'all raise your hands? East Hampton Climate Action Group. You can you can come meet Shelley or Paula. And um, they can connect you. Um, you get on their roster and get emails about uh, different actions for climate. And also, the Sunrise Movement is here, um, and <laughs> and here, and <laughs> boy, over there. Okay, <laughs> yeah. Please raise your hands. We're all nice and proud, so people what, can see. What is the Sunrise Movement? Yeah, say more. And the Sunrise is a, a youth movement, so I believe it's uh, 35 and younger. Um, and they're organizing strikes, um, and but they could uh, fill you in on a lot more of uh, of what they're doing um, than I could. <laughs> um, thank you for the question. Appreciate it. Uh, did, did I answer it or? I mean, um, in a general sense, yeah. But I, I want to know like when the next meeting is. <laughs> <laughs> it's to be dated, actually. Yeah. That's what the so the the roster well, let's is make it about soon. Um, to. It's, it says, uh, the People Assembly, thanks for joining the, uh, the Rebel Alliance. Uh, write your code name here, um, email, and then um, I'm, I'm, I'm offering copies of uh, something that I'm writing called the Sign Guy Chronicles. You can say yes or no if you're interested in a copy. Um, I'm doing a documentary on people's opinion about the climate and um, an environmental issue. And if you want to be uh, interviewed and be a part of the project, you can say yes or no. And, um, and then at the end, it's if you want to um, be a part of the People's Assembly uh, or not. And, um, and so you yeah, just give me your email, and then, and then we'll connect each other in email. And, and can you it'll send it around through there? I can start yeah. floating it around. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, sir. As far as doing some homework, I mean, can we look up permaculture? And I always thought of permaculture as sort of a gardening kind of thing where you put some sticks down first and then you put some uh -huh. other stuff on top of it. Well, um, you get aeration. But I think you're talking about something a little bit broader than just gardening. Yeah, it's, it's, it's well, it's, um, it's permanent agriculture, um, more thinking of doing things in a way that's more permanent, more long lasting, and you're, you're doing all kinds of tricks. like. Um, uh, there's many different examples of permaculture, and I'll give you the, the, the best resources right now. Um, it's um, uh, Sepp Holster wrote a book, Sepp Holster, um, and he did a, he's a millionaire permaculture designer, um, so he, he profits a lot from his farm. Um, then there's Mark Shepard in the United States, and he wrote a book called uh, Restoration Agriculture, and um, they, they both have different uh, philosophies, but one is like sort of living on a mountainous area, and then Mark Shepard is sort of in the plains. Um, so uh, what you come to find about permaculture is depending on where you are, you're gonna be researching different people um, that are have uh, other expert expertise. And a good resource for, um, uh, there's, there's a forum, a permaculture forum online. Oh man, I forgot the name. Well, uh, there's there's forums online where people in their region uh, discuss different things, and there's actual websites that you can buy into that could tell you all the different perennial plants of the region. The man for Western Massachusetts is Eric Townsmere, by bar none. He um, he wrote a book called Perennial Vegetables, and he wrote a book called uh, Forest Gardening Series and uh, Carbon Farming. He, he wrote many books. Uh, he's from Amherst. What's and, your last name again, please? Uh, Eric Ta Tones. Tones. Uh, he's in Holyoke. He's in Holyoke. Hmm. Yeah. 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 
I believe that's how you spell it. I, I might have massacred his last name, Tellingsmere. I'm not sure the ending is right. That'll, yes. that'll, that'll give you close, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Paradise, um, Paradise wow. Lot. Paradise Lot is, is a book that he wrote. Paradise Lot is more of a, more of a romance novel, I think. <laughs> but, but if you want the details, get his perennial vegetables book. It gives you all the different okay. varieties of, of, of that to grow in the region. Um, I Hi. want to thank you for all that you've done, and I just moved here from New York, and um, part of why I moved here uh, in this town in particular is because I saw you with your signs with single-use plastic. Awesome. And it just moved Look at the momentum we have in this room. It's amazing, and yes. there's clearly so many knowledgeable and passionate people here. Um, I should also say... I was an entrepreneur in New York, and I founded a company that was like the Pedal People. Um, and we picked up compost by bike, and I taught uh, recycling at large scale events. And I met PJ at the farmers market, and um, I really want to get involved. Um, I also had started with a bunch of friends, a small group called the Green Beacon Coalition. I'm from Beacon, New York. And we had all these little working groups. So we'd have a working group on um, energy, one on um, trying to remove single-use plastics from our little town is like 15,000 people. Um, wow. We'd have a group of people that would do events, so like hosting uh, an open house where you can come in and see like a rain barrel and like see an amazing garden and like look at solar panels, like learn more and like make stuff. So I'm um, all about action and getting stuff done and I've been looking for the right time to like plug in. Um, yeah, like this gentleman over here said, like I'm, I'm ready to sign up and, and help out, and you know, it's amazing with all this energy. So, but, yeah. So. Awesome. So yeah, that would be uh, agenda item number one in the people's assembly would be when's the next meeting? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah and one more thing I want to say, you don't have to have a nonprofit to like get momentum and like get sure. something going. You right on. Yeah, I figure we could just do a yeah, lot of volunteer work. And, and then like we had an umbrella through the city of Beacon, so we got funding. Whatever money money we got, we worked with another nonprofit organization and we funneled it through. So we didn't even have like a bank account or anything. We got so much done and it was so cool and it continues. So. Also, I look forward to learning from you. And, and Likewise. <laughs> right on. I ask that people stand up. To Oh, okay. Yes. Uh, all right. So, if if you're gonna speak, please stand up and, and try to speak loudly so everybody can hear what you have to say. It's, it's, going, it's, it's around. going around. It's still up in the front. So also just a, a time. It's seven thirty. Just to give it's you a placement of seven. So we have yeah, what so an hour like left. Until eight. Okay. Until eight. We're here until eight. Here yeah. until eight. So thirty minutes left. Okay. Yes. Uh, Eli. While I was waiting to ask one question, I thought of another, so... Uh, turn around. Turn around. So, so, so uh, if, 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 if it's okay, I'd like to ask two questions. Um, but, all right, one, one, the first one is, um, there seems to be a, a... There's a conflict in my mind between two of the things that you were talking about and I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on how to resolve it. Okay. So, okay. So, on the one hand, um, we on, on the one hand, we want to we want to pass laws to make the to make things better. And on the other hand, the more laws we pass and the more complex the law gets, the more power we give to to our cruel and and oppressive legal system. Um, and so, I, I don't I don't know what the solution to that is. So, I don't know if you have any thoughts. I you know as far as the um, we have to make the system uncruel. Like I understand that. Like um, for example, like all it took was people that disliked me to get into groups and to lie on paper about me for their paperwork to reach the DA's office, and then automatically like you know now I have to defend myself and, and in this system it's like you're guilty until proven innocent <clears throat> so I, I understand like how corrupt the system is but um, like I don't see the laws that is gonna fix the system coming from politicians that are getting millions of dollars from lobbyists from multinational corporations 
And so I feel that like there's a real calling on the U.S. citizen for us to get together and to think up of how how are we going to do it. And so maybe maybe we we're going to have to think of a strategy. Maybe first we need to pass laws that make the judicial system more fair before we. I don't, you know, I don't I don't have an answer to that question, but I just. Uh, as far as like the effort and I, what I feel is a, a need for that effort to happen, I, I, I feel strongly that, that we need to um, get together and, and try to like um, write legislation of our own um, instead of being dependent on, like I said again, bought off uh, politicians. Okay, and can I say one more thing? Yes. So the other thing is I've, I've in, in other kind of sustainability oriented groups that I've, I've tried to participate in there there's been a, there's been like a very heavy kind of uh, um, bias toward toward uh, people who are fortunate enough to own property and the, and the, the with regard to like the the things that the, that we try to do like it's it seem, always seems to be things that I I as someone who is not that fortunate can't really can't really be a part of, and so I was just wondering if, if you have any way to to make it so that so that this group is is different. So um, how I want to understand your question a little better. Um, I I don't own property, and I feel at mercy to everybody else that owns property for the changes that happen to help create a more you know. Uh, ecologically sane environment and that could provide some food security and at least do our own part of sequestering part, uh, carbon in the uh, local region. Um, uh, is that sort of what you're uh, addressing, that you, know, you don't have any land yourself and, and so not having property? Yeah, I mean um, in terms of the kinds of, the kinds of things that we, the kinds of things that, that we would work on in this group and, and our priorities is it things that you know is it is, are they things that I would that, that would be things that I would be able to participate in and that would be meaningful to me yes I think and, it would be even if it's somebody else's property that we're working on it, it's extremely educational and uh, and it will empower you to be able to help others to do the same um, you can spread the knowledge um, we can uh, you know um, the more that I learn about plants, I, I feel more secure. I, you know, I, I can look outside uh, and, and say there was a food security crisis taking place. I, I know which leaves from which trees to harvest from. You know, I, I know which bark I can, I can take and, and make food out of. And, and I think that there's a, there's a great sense of security and, and having a relationship with plants. So if anything, uh, the work that we'll be doing will extremely benefit you, I, I believe, um, in the long run. Sorry, I just want to ask kind of a, to follow up on that question as the um, roster is going around, is there a spot on the roster to say like what working groups you would be interested in joining or is that kind of the next phase? Uh, no, same? that seems like that would be part That's of the next around. phase. <laughs> yeah, okay, great. Yeah, I mean, it's a multi-phase process, so let's, let's yeah. start. <laughs> right on. I just wanted to mention that East Hampton Climate Action Youth Hampton Climate Action, which is just a local group made out of a few people who started a year or two ago, is having its next meeting on 4th of March, so next Wednesday. We get together once every three weeks, and there's groups, Where? Um, different places. But I can, we have a Facebook page, and I can write two emails that if you reach out to us, we'll get back to you. and. The, the the time for the next meeting is already set, but I can't remember the address. Either. I think uh, it's, isn't it in the second floor of the, um, the municipal? Building? Not the municipal, but the fire and police. Isn't that what? Oh, it, I, no. Uh, no. I, I'm not sure where it is. I can look it up. But what I can do is there's a Facebook page, and I'll put two email addresses that will definitely get back to you if anybody's interested. Oh, right. You want to you write it on the board? <laughs> I wrote four marks. You said the time actually.
please come up and eat the food? I'm not taking it home. <laughs> yes, sir. Oh, ma'am. I'm sorry. Um, to Eli's question about not being a homeowner, there are a lot of homeowners like myself who have disability, um, and I really welcome um, my yards to be done with and not be, because I don't water my lawn, but I groom it, and that's it. But I would like to think that sweat equity is something that I could use and I could also share, because I can do some, but I can't do all. And, and as far as people wanting to get their hands dirty, I'm sure there's a lot of people in the community who could use help um, doing just that and, and transposing um, lawn into other purpose, permaculture. I'm interested in the pollinator, and, and I think that that has, we can all help each other in that way, you know, we're just putting it out there. Okay. Well, please eat the food. <laughs> there's a lot of food. Really good. And if there's no other questions, thank you very much for your time.